This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Legs are just stupid arms. Let me explain. To start off, we're going to start with the bones of your upper and lower lip because they're darn near identical. Up top, you've got your humerus, which extends from your shoulder to your elbow. Fun fact, your shoulder joint is also called your glenohumeral joint because it's your humerus and the glenoid fossa of your scapula, or what you might call your shoulder blade. So your shoulder blade is what actually makes your shoulder. In fact, your shoulder blade is way more involved with this whole situation than a lot of people realize. Just below your humerus is your elbow, which is also not what a lot of people think. In fact, the point of your elbow here is actually just the closest end of this bone, which is called your ulna. On the other side of your forearm is this bone called your radius. Everything below that is your hand, and we'll get there in a minute. Now comparing all that to the leg, the uppermost bone of the leg is called the femur, which extends from your hip down to your knee, where it articulates with both the tibia bone and also the patella, which you probably just call a kneecap. The tibia is the larger bone in your lower leg, and the very bottom of it makes that bony lump on the inside of your ankle, which we call the medial malleolus. The other side of your ankle also has a bony lump, which is called the lateral malleolus, and that's the bottom of the other bone in your lower leg called the fibula. So right away, there's a lot of notable similarities here. Both of these structures have one big bone, which has a flexible upper joint, which connects to two smaller bones, which end at either a hand or a foot. And here's where you might argue that arms and legs are actually significantly different. After all, hands and feet may look a little bit similar, but they have some subtle differences, like the fact that you have eight bones in your wrist and only seven bones in your ankle, and some very obvious differences, like the fact that your heel is one of those ankle bones called the calcaneus. In fact, all of the tarsal bones, which are commonly just called ankle bones, are in the foot. What you would call your ankle is actually just the very bottom of your tibia and fibula. Those ankle bones don't actually flex with your actual ankle. And that sounds crazy until you remember that your carpal bones, otherwise known as wrist bones, work the exact same way. Your actual wrist is just the very end of your radius and ulna. All those little wrist bones are actually right here in the base of your palm. And that seems shocking if you're only used to thinking about humans. But if you look at pretty much any quadruped or four-legged animal, you're going to see that they have the exact same bones in pretty much the exact same places and that they serve very similar functions. We may think of our bone structure differently, but in reality, it's a homology that we share with all tetrapods. Let me explain what that means, too. You see, a homologous structure is any trait, any structure, any organ, any bone, what we biologists would usually just call a character, which is shared across multiple species because all those species share a common ancestor, which also had that character, and so they passed it down to all of their descendants. And that's what separates homologous structures from analogous structures, which are characters which are shared by multiple different species, which don't have a common ancestor with that character, but instead evolved it independently multiple times. A great example of that is wings, which evolved independently in birds, mammals, reptiles, and insects at totally different times. But the coolest part about our shared limb structure is that this isn't even a shared trait across all primates or even across all mammals, because it goes back way before mammals even evolved, around 400 million years ago to the very first tetrapods, which means this isn't even a synapomorphy, it's a symplesiomorphy. Let me explain what that means too. You see, when we study evolution, we often use individual characters to define, describe, and diagnose evolutionary groups, or as we call them, phylogenies. And we have a whole suite of words that we use to describe those characters within the context of those phylogenies. So a synapomorphy is a trait that is found in two or more different taxa, or groups of organisms, that is also found in their common ancestors. So for example, hair is a synapomorphy of mammals. Now that sounds an awful lot like a homologous structure. But remember, a homologous structure is a structure. It's something that actually exists. The lack of a structure could also be a synapomorphy. So all homologous structures are synapomorphies, but not all synapomorphies are homologous structures. Other words that we use to describe these traits include apomorphy which describes a trait which is found in one group, but not their common ancestor with another group. That is to say, it's a derived trait, not a primitive trait. 
A great example of that is opposable thumbs in primates. And when that derived trait is unique to that one group, we call it an autopomorphy. A great example of that is the complete loss of legs in snakes. And then there are homoplasies, which sounds an awful lot like homologies, but is actually the exact opposite. Homoplasies are traits which arise in two completely different taxa that don't share a common ancestor that also had that trait. An example of that, as I mentioned before, is wings. And this is where the language of cladistics starts to get a little bit tricky, because depending on what you're looking at, you might use these terms very differently. For example, I mentioned opposable thumbs as an apomorphy of primates, but other species like koalas and possums also have opposable thumbs. So if I was talking about all mammals, this wouldn't be an apomorphy of primates, it would be a homoplasy that shared with primates, possums, and koalas. But if I was talking about just primates, this would actually be a synapomorphy because the common ancestor of primates also had opposable thumbs. And when we're talking about the limb structure of mammals, we can't call that a synapomorphy because it goes back way further than the common ancestor of all mammals. So instead, we call this a symplesiomorphy which means a trait that's shared by multiple taxa, but isn't even unique to their common ancestor. It goes back way further than that. Whales, chickens, frogs, geckos all share this exact same bone structure because we all inherited it from the very first tetrapods 400 million years ago. So if we're talking about the bone structure of tetrapods, then yes, it's a synapomorphy. But if we're talking about birds, reptiles, and mammals, it's a symplesiomorphy. Also, just a heads up, a lot of biologists just use the word plesiomorphy, which means the exact same thing as symplesiomorphy. These are synonyms. Plesiomorphy is a little bit more common nowadays. I just prefer the word symplesiomorphy because it has like a built-in mnemonic. Symplesiomorphies are simple because they go back so far and they're so easy to define. Anyway, now that we got all that out of the way, we can finally get back to the point of the video, which is that arms and legs are pretty similar because we inherited their muscle and bone structure from early quadrupeds millions and millions and millions of years ago. But the point that I was trying to make here is that the major difference between them is actually that they have different fascial layers, and that is also something that I should probably explain. You see, fascia is connective tissue that compartmentalizes and anchors different tissue layers within your body. For example, it's the reason why your skin isn't just a loose bag that's sliding all over you. You have fascia that is holding it down to the underlying tissues. Fascia also contributes to the stability of joints by making it more difficult for things to pop in and out of place, and to the function of muscles by wrapping them up and helping them transmit the forces that they generate by contracting in the right directions. But you also have specialized kinds of fascia which combine their efforts with the muscles around and beneath them to create emergent effects. For example, you have a particularly dense and tough kind of fascia called fascia lata that surrounds your legs. And you have a dedicated muscle called tensor fascia lata right here on the side of your hip and thigh region that, as the name suggests, pulls that fascia lata tight whenever you move your thighs. And tensor fascia lata is one of my favorite muscles in the whole body because what that means is that fascia lata is compressing your leg muscles, forcing them to push in rather than bulge out, which puts pressure on the deep veins of your legs, squeezing blood up towards the top half of your body, which reduces the strain on your heart trying to pump up against gravity. How cool is that? So having different kinds of fascia in your arms and your legs hold your muscles together, it makes your muscles more efficient, it helps your cardiovascular system. Incidentally, it's the whole reason why you're able to get an erection, but like, why would I say that? Let me explain. The penis is primarily comprised of three columns of erectile tissue. The two columns on top are made of corpus cavernosum, the one column on the bottom that surrounds your urethra is made of corpus spongiosum. Now the primary function of these erectile tissues is to swell with blood, but that really wouldn't be useful unless they were also wrapped in a super dense layer of fascia called Buck's fascia. Without Buck's fascia, the corpus spongiosum and corpus cavernosum wouldn't have anything to push against to maintain fluid pressure, so the penis wouldn't become hard and rigid, it would just get real wide and floppy like a water balloon. 
And I know what you're gonna ask. Yes, there is also another layer of fascia called darktose fascia, which surrounds both the penis and the scrotum. But in the scrotum, it has some interwoven muscle fibers, so it's sometimes also called darktose muscle. And that's what causes the scrotum to get all crinkly and wrinkly whenever the testicles retract. But remember, the retraction of the testicles is controlled by a totally different muscle called cremaster. The cremaster muscle is what raises and lowers the testes. And you can remember that because it's the master of the crem. <laughs> and by the way, this little stalk that holds up a cocoon or chrysalis so that a caterpillar can turn into a moth or butterfly, that's also called a cremaster. And now you'll never be able to see a butterfly again without thinking about balls. You're welcome. The point is that turgidity and tension are like the whole major function of these fascial layers. And that doesn't just go for male genitalia. It's kind of the same business for like the whole legs in general. And actually, it's kind of funny that I mentioned caterpillars because it's also like the whole reason that worms work because they Look, I swear we're going to get back to legs in a second. Just let me explain. Worms don't have a skeleton, which means they don't have a rigid internal framework to provide support and structure for their body and facilitate locomotion. So instead, they rely on what's called a hydrostatic skeleton, which comes in the form of a hollow fluid-filled channel called a coelom surrounded by muscles. When a worm wants to move, it contracts the longitudinal muscles that run the length of its body, increasing the pressure within that coelom and causing the worm to become elongated and rigid, kinda like the erectile tissues in a human penis. Then the worm anchors the front of its body to the ground, pushes the fluid through the coelom to move the front of its body forward, and does the same thing, only slightly different in the back half of its body, to drag that half along, creating the wave-like worm motion that we all know and love. And this is especially cool in segmented worms, because those segments allow for the worm to become more flexible and have more fine muscle control, and that actually connects back to arms and legs, because surprisingly enough, those segments through tagmosis kind of become the precursors to less worm-like bodies. It's, it's all connected because... Let me explain. Tagmosis, or as I learned it in school, tagmatization, although not a lot of people use that word anymore, is the evolutionary process of grouping segments within an organism's body into specialized units called tagmata. So for example, in arthropods, tagmosis results in those different groups of segments becoming different structures like the head, thorax, and abdomen, which then do different functions like feeding, locomotion, and reproduction. And while it certainly isn't as pronounced as it is in arthropods, there's still some degree of tagmosis within worms, like for example, the clitellum of an earthworm, which is that little band near the head, which is actually very important for reproduction. Now log that in your brain and fast forward to embryo development. Embryos also contain different segments, which inevitably group together and form different parts of the body. At a certain point, on a certain part of the embryo, certain cells will develop into what we call limb buds, which will eventually differentiate and specialize more and more into arms, legs, wings, or whatever else that thing is supposed to have, which is why I just said certain things, because it's all very much species dependent. And this is where we get into the field of evolutionary developmental biology, or EVO-DEVO for short, which, among other things, studies how these little tiny changes to develop developmental pathways and mechanisms can cause massive changes in evolutionary trajectory because after all what limbs you grow and where you grow them is kind of a big part of macroevolution. And now that we're back on the topic of limbs, which is supposed to be the point of this whole video anyway, but whatever, your legs and arms have very similar muscle structures as well as bone structures. In fact, if you were to take your chest and arms and just like turn them around backwards, you'd have almost the exact same musculoskeletal structure as your butt and legs, only your butt and legs are just slightly more complicated. Now, I'm gonna have to leave a lot of stuff out here. Each of your arms has 30 bones, more than 50 muscles, not to mention the sheer number of tendons, ligaments, blood vessels, nerves, lymphatic ducts, and as I just said, your legs are even more complicated than that, but if you look at just the big picture, you can start to see some patterns. For example, here on your chest, you have two muscles, pectoralis major and a smaller muscle underneath it called pectoralis minor, but your butt actually has three muscles, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and gluteus minimus. Here on the front of your arms, you have a muscle called biceps brachii, a two-headed muscle that flexes the arm. But on the back of your legs, you have a group of muscles that are commonly called hamstrings, one of which is biceps femoris, a two-headed muscle that flexes the knee. On the back of your arm, you have triceps, a three-headed muscle which extends the arm. On the front of your leg, you have quadriceps, not a four-headed muscle, but actually four distinct muscles which extend the leg. 
Vastus lateralis, Vastus medialis, Vastus intermedius, and rectus femoris. Perhaps a better example would be the muscles that flex and extend your fingers. Muscles like flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus, extensor digitalis, extensor digiti minimi, and extensor indices, all of which are here in your forearm, which is kind of similar to the muscles that flex and extend your toes, which are all here in your lower leg, except for flexor digitorum brevis, which is actually in your foot, which is super weird, and all the rest of the muscles have to have their tendons wrapping around and underneath your ankle. It's madness. Believe me, I could go on and on and on with this, but it wouldn't be super necessary because a group of similarly named muscles does not a stupid limb make. What is important to talk about, however, is the vast differences in sensory and motor functions between your arms and legs. Your hands are capable of some incredibly intricate tasks, like typing on a keyboard or threading a needle. And even the things that you just do in your day-to-day -day life that you don't even really think about are all made possible because of an astonishingly detailed network of muscles and nerves that, if you didn't know any better, wouldn't be any more impressive at face value than the ones found in your legs. Seriously, go try to pick up a coin with one of your feet sometime and tell me how it goes for you. You have more muscles down there, and yet you're not capable of even a fraction of the same things. And it's not just the fine motor control of our hands that makes them so remarkable. It's also their amazing sensitivity to touch. The skin on our hands is packed with millions of sensory receptors, which allows us to detect the slightest changes in pressure and temperature and texture. And that gives us the ability to do remarkably dexterous things with pinpoint accuracy. And of course, this all ties back into our evolutionary history, because as primates, we need our hands for a lot more than just walking and climbing. We also use them for grooming and for foraging and for tool making as well. But as our arms became more and more specialized for increasingly detailed tasks, our legs kind of just remain legs. So while I'm certainly not upset about this fact, I think it's really important to bear in mind that arms and legs are remarkably similar, except for the fact that legs are overcomplicated, not very sensitive, have low motor control, and are also completely different. In short, legs are just stupid arms. Thank you for taking this deep dive into human anatomy and accidentally a bunch of other stuff with me today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider checking out my Patreon because my patrons are the reason why this whole channel is possible. And if you like learning weird things about cool stuff, also consider checking out the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an education app that allows you to learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in science, math, data analysis, programming, and even AI. All of which are handcrafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from places like MIT, Caltech, Duke, and more. Brilliant's interactive daily lessons make their education style uniquely effective as they build more than just your knowledge base, but also problem-solving skills and a powerful daily learning habit. And the best part is they're offering my subscribers everything Brilliant has to offer absolutely free for a full 30 days, plus 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium if they just go to brilliant.org slash forestvalkai or use the link in the description below. As for me, I'm a huge fan of their scientific thinking course because it teaches you how to think about the world around you in scientific terms and how to appreciate the beauty of the universe that you live in. No matter what you want to learn next, starting with that lesson is always a good idea. So get started today by heading over to brilliant.org slash forestvalkai or just using the link in the description below. Remember, you get to try everything that Brilliant has to offer absolutely free for a full 30 days and get 20% off your annual subscription to Brilliant Premium. It helps you, it helps your brain, and it helps the channel. So check it out. And with that, I'm Forest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop, pick up a sweet t-shirt, have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye.